Hello everyone and welcome to this new video. Today we will talk about the Sykes-Picot Agreement following up with the Severus and the Lausanne Treaty. What are these and how did they affect the Kurdish future? Before we start don't forget to like this video, comment your opinion down below and hit the subscribe button so that you don't miss any further videos on this channel. Also don't forget to follow us on Instagram everything about Kurdistan where we publish more regular posts about the Kurdish question. Lastly, for those who want to support us, you can now become a Patreon for this channel. By supporting us, you are helping us to reach our goals and projects. Read more about these projects in the description box below. Now, without further ado, let's get into the video. The three different agreements and treaties we're gonna talk about comes in this order. Sykes-Picot Agreement in 1916. Treaty of Severus in 1920 and Treaty of Lausanne in 1923. So let's start with the first one, Sykes-Picot Agreement. And to understand this agreement, we need to go back two years earlier to the 28th of June 1940. At this particular day, the Serbian nationalist Gavrilo Princip assassinated the Austro-Hungarian heir of the throne, Franz Ferdinand, and his wife Sophie when they were visiting the occupied Sarajevo. This assassination resulted in worse political conflicts than what already existed in that time and soon enough everybody in Europe were in war with each other, also affecting the different colonies of the superpowers during World War I. The Ottoman Empire which at its peak controlled large areas of Middle East, North Africa and Balkan would soon take side in this war. After losing several important territories in the recent decades, the empire was desperate to show their strength to the world as they joined the German and Austrian-Hungarian side. Ruled by the so-called Young Turks, battles were soon held between the Ottoman Empire and the British forces in Palestine, Jordan, Syria and the Arabian Peninsula all the way until 1918. The Brits also called for an Arabic uprising against the Ottoman power, promising the Sharif of Mecca an own Sunni Muslim empire after the war was over. For the Sharif of Mecca, ruling an Arabic empire in the Middle East were more attractive than being part of a Turkish one. And this is where the Ottoman Empire started to suffer more and more by internal conflicts as well. However, in secrecy the Brits and the Frenchmen drew their own borders. The Colonel Mark Sykes and the diplomat Francois George Picot was tasked with creating a plan of how the different provinces of the Ottoman Empire would be split up if the Ottoman Empire would lose the war. The plan was called the Sykes-Picot Agreement and was completed in 16th of May 1916, marking the future borders of British and French controlled colonies in the previous areas of the Ottoman Empire. The agreement was a top secret at first, but became public in 1917 as Vladimir Lenin's Bolsheviks found the agreement in the archives of the Tsardom of Russia. Hundred years later, the majority of the people in the Middle East knows about the Sykes-Picot Agreement and the great consequences that this plan led to. However, the plan is not anything that people speak about much in the Western world. In January 1918, 10 months before the First World War ended, America's President Woodrow Wilson spoke to the American Congress where he presented his 14 points of self-determination. These were a collection of principles that deferred greatly to the Sykes-Picot Agreement. The points demanded freedom for all European countries which had suffered of war and occupation during the war. Point number 12 meant that the Turkish dominating part of the Ottoman Empire has to be guaranteed independence and that different peoples of the rest of the empire has to be guaranteed autonomy. Point number 14 suggested the creation of League of Nations in order to secure territorial integrity among small and big states. President Wilson was later awarded with the Nobel Peace Prize for this initiative. In 1919, the peace conference in Versailles was held to plan the new Europe. The conference was dominated by the winners of the war, Britain, France, America and Italy, and the deal would create nine new states in Europe. 
In April 1920, one year later, representatives from Great Britain, France and Italy met in the Italian city of San Remo to discuss how they could create even more states. They wanted to share the different territories from the Ottoman Empire between themselves. However, in Syria the Arabs had started their own uprising and refused to be part of the French ruling. Ruled by Faisal bin Hussein, son of the Sharif of Mecca, which the Brits earlier promised independence, they declared an own kingdom. The king claimed areas of Sham, the Levant, Palestine, Lebanon and Syria, as well as half of Mesopotamia. After French military intervened a few months later, the Arabs were forced to submit to the terms of the Western powers, something that would leave a very bitter aftertaste for many Arabs. Among those who felt threatened or even a little bit inspired by the new Arabic uprising were many Kurds. At this time, Kurdish nationalism grew rapidly, even though the thoughts of Kurdish independence was much older than these times. A few Kurdish representatives were present in the meetings in Versailles 1990. However, they couldn't agree on whether the Kurds wanted full independence or just autonomy. When the conference in San Remo were held in 1920, there were no Kurds there. However, a map was sent to the meeting by the newly formed Society for the Rise of Kurdish. The map showed the borders for a Kurdish homeland and with Woodrow Wilson's 14 points in mind, a committee was tasked to solve a Kurdish autonomy in southeastern Turkey with the city of Ahmed as its capital city. The idea was to let the Kurds apply for independence to the League of Nations within a year. This and other decisions which were decided in San Remo were formally signed as the Treaty of Severus in August 1920. Soon the Western power got their mandates in the Middle East based on the Sykes-Picot Agreement where Palestine, Jordan and Iraq were given to the Brits and Syria and Lebanon were given to France. The area around Mosul, an occupied province from the Ottoman Empire, was to begin with part of Syria and France. But soon the British state found a lot of oil in the area and they adjusted the borders. Instead, the French state was given their fair share of the winning oil resources. The Treaty of Severus aimed to dismantle the Ottoman Empire and demanded the Turkish leaders to let go of their previous occupied territories. However, the Turks were furious on the colonial powers and started their own war of independence as the capital city of Constantinople was under British and French occupation. The Turkish nationalist leader Mustafa Kemal united the Turks and led the fight. He refused to accept the Treaty of Severus. In 1921, Mustafa Kemal won a lot of important victories. The Greek army was defeated in Smyrna and Armenian forces in northeast were pushed back. France had two options, either to go in with full force or to renegotiate the Treaty of Severus. After secret meetings, part of Syrian occupied Kurdistan were given to the Turks and became Turkish occupied Kurdistan, cities like Nisibin and Shizir. The Frenchmen drew a new border alongside the railway down to Baghdad. After continuous Turkish resistance and military threats, the Brits also started to adapt. In 1923, a conference was held in Lausanne where Mustafa Kemal's representation were present. When the second meeting were finished in July 1923, a new deal had been signed, the so-called Treaty of Lausanne. In this new treaty, the Turkish border at that time were recognized only if the Turks would let go of their claim on other previous areas of the Ottoman Empire and just like that, a few months later the Turkish state was declared. In the Treaty of Lausanne, the word Kurdistan was not mentioned one single time. The promises that Western powers had given to the Kurds about autonomy and the possibility to even seek independence within a year were forgotten and never mentioned again. 
both Kurds, Arabs, Armenians and Assyrians were dissatisfied for a long time to come. They didn't want to see their areas and families split up by international borders, which were made up by some Europeans. The betrayal towards the Kurds were doubled. Firstly, they didn't get their great Kurdistan and secondly, not even a smaller part such as the Arabs got. The Kurds became the biggest people in the world without a state of their own. Simply big minorities in several different states. The saying no friends but the mountains couldn't be more current for the Kurds and that saying would repeat itself several times in the years to come. Since the Gulf War in 1991 the Kurds have achieved more and more. First a region in Iraqi occupied Kurdistan which has its up and downs. This region was fortified in 2003 and once again in 2006 as the regime of Saddam fell and a new Iraq was formed. Later on, as the Syrian civil war started in 2011, the Kurds achieved even more freedom as the YPG came out and took areas in Syrian occupied Kurdistan. The two different areas of Kurdistan are now aiming to build up a state. One faces corruption and internal conflicts, while other faces external enemies. However, many can agree that in an area like the Middle East, these two projects is better than other alternatives in the region. Now, as the Treaty of Lausanne is expiring in 2023, as it's only valid for 100 years, question has started to be asked of what we can expect from this. Will the Western power form new states as they did before the Treaty of Lausanne, and will the Kurds be included this time, or will we simply see an extension of the treaty for another 100 years or so? Let us know in the comment section what you believe will happen, and as always, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and like this video. If you want to know what we think will happen, click on this video right here where we talk about Erdogan and the possible revival of the Ottoman Empire which will form new consequences and new wars. Perhaps the Kurds can find something out of this new potential war.